We turn to the fourth case on this morning's docket. It's case number <coughs> 102749, State of Kansas v. Ryan Powell. Please, Court Counsel, I'm Corey Collier representing Ryan Powell. I would request three minutes for rebuttal, please. Three minutes is granted. Thank you. Um, this is a uh, we raised two issues, both of which relate to the denial of a motion to suppress. The first issue is a Leon good faith exception is, uh, issue, and the second challenges whether or not uh, the search warrant statute 222502 uh, authorizes search warrants for blood. Uh, DNA evidence. I'll just start with the first issue and maybe get to the second if we, if we have time. <coughs> As I said, the first issue is a Leon good faith exception issue, which means that the district court in this case found that the affidavit did not support probable cause. The affidavit in this case was for uh, blood, hair, uh, saliva, and fingerprints from Mr. Powell. There was a, a car, a police car was stolen. And the what they wanted, the there was uh, they crashed the car into a ditch, and there was blood in the car, but they didn't put that in the warrant. <coughs> that there was any DNA or any blood, anything found, and so the, the district court ultimately decided that the affidavit didn't support probable cause because there was no uh, correlation between what was found in the car and uh, Mr. Powell's blood. So uh, then we. Move I guess to I'm going to interrupt you here because I want you to step back from that. I I don't I don't understand why you're even suggesting that if there had been a correlation, a reference in the search warrant or to, in the affidavit to the biological sample found on the windshield, even if they had said we want his blood so we can make that connection, so we can link his DNA to to that biological material. It still wouldn't. There still wouldn't be a nexus between the item to be searched or the place to be searched. Or in this case, it's a person being searched in some ways, and the crime. There, there still wouldn't be a nexus, would there? Well, shouldn't your argument be it wouldn't have made any difference, and and that there's no, there's nothing else. There's three anonymous, three anonymous tips with no credibility, no reliability, no, no. No, nothing. Well, uh, probable, make... cause, probable cause that uh, Mr. Powell's DNA would match the DNA, I think. Right, that he was, in, to say, he right. was involved at all. Did any of these tips say, there didn't seem to be any information about the tips, but if one of them, for instance, had said, oh, I know that he was in that car or that he's the one that stole the car and wrecked it, and by the way, he had a big bruise on his head or... He told me that he hit his windshield to the head. Then you'd still have to evaluate these anonymous tips, but sure. at least there would be the linkage between the crime. And I guess I don't understand why you seem to be giving up that even if there had been linkage, there would be probable cause with three anonymous, three anonymous tips and no real linkage here. Right. And I, I guess uh, and. You're, you're, you're probably right. I'll say if you think that's how I should have won, then I'm not going to argue that I should well, win I, that way. I guess uh, I'm, I'm telling you, we don't we have to evaluate? If this is a Leon good faith issue, and that's what we're being asked to evaluate, we can't ignore what the whole package was. We sure. have to look at what there sure, was. Yeah. I guess what I'll I just, see and, and I'm, I'm probably wrong, nothing. but I'll go through my thought process on it, uh, is that if the affidavit had said that we had found blood in the, in the car, and and uh, you accept that the the uh, affidavit. I think I made the argument that the affidavit doesn't even point to Mr. Powell being involved. Isn't sufficient for that. But if you accept that it does, that he was involved in the car, because there was a tip that said he was a passenger. There was a tip I think that said that he actually took the car. So he was involved in that. And you say we found material at the, uh, the we found blood on the windshield. My, my thought process was, from a good faith standpoint, an officer may believe that the 
he was involved in it, and there's blood. We need to see if he was involved with the blood. Uh, so, that, so they can, so, so yeah, they I, can, I, 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 they can connect it. Yes, They're uh, going to make the connection. They're going to link this crime to this defendant when they get this evidence. Not, they've got to have the right, they have yeah. to have the nexus <coughs> before they. You know, yeah, before I, they I, get I, I agree with that. That that, that, that would have been a, certainly an, an additional argument. Um, that, that, I, that I didn't make, and, and I would. Let's say they had linked it. Let's say one of these anonymous sources had somehow linked to this defendant. You know, he bumped his head, or he admitted he wrecked the car and hit his head, or something that would indicate that was his biological material on the windshield. Let's say there was that. What do you What do you make of these three anonymous sources with no credibility, no no nothing? Right, and I think... What's uh, the source of their information? That, Have that's we, right. And, and that, that's something was it that, verified? Is there any corroboration? We know nothing about that, them. That's right. You know nothing. And, and the officer knows nothing. And we're obviously dealing with a lesser standard here on, on what an officer knows. But I think there has to be... Um, we have to impute some knowledge of probable cause... The, the, the law surrounding probable cause, not enough of a judge, but some amount of probable cause or else the analysis doesn't make any sense. So that um, if the officer is determined, a reasonable, objectively reasonable officer looks at, the, um, looks at the affidavit and says, this isn't enough probable cause here. They have to have some understanding of what probable cause is and what constitutes probable cause in order to make that determination. So obviously it's the law that... Um, you have to have some verification or some background on who is giving the tips. But but you're saying in this instance the officers weren't even charged with that responsibility of applying legal uh, concept of probable cause because there's nothing in the affidavit that would tell them that blood uh, uh, or saliva or DNA evidence had anything to do with the price of tea in China. That's, that's exactly right. Yes. Because it, uh, they, or, or at least to this uh, incident. Right. Yeah, a reasonable officer would have no basis uh, to believe, there was nothing in the affidavit to give a reasonable officer um, any indication that Mr. Powell's blood was relevant to this case at all. And I, I guess I want to clarify that you think had they just said that, and their argument is it's somehow inferred from the affidavit. But uh, your argument is if they had just said it, that'd be enough. Well, I, I, not anymore. <laughs> uh, but it was when you stood up. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, but I, I, I certainly see that, that point. Well, I, I guess I would like for you to explain that to me because I'm not even understanding what, how you would, why you would make that argument. Uh, well, I, 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 What's the link? Yeah, I, 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 I Just wanna, saying it makes it so? I mean, that's, that's what I, I get. I, 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 wanna, I think I want to agree with you, uh, what you're saying, and I'm, okay. uh, I, I'm struggling with... Uh, with uh, I'm thinking maybe I'm not understanding your argument. Well, um, I, I guess I, I'm hoping I'm, that my argument doesn't conflict with your argument. <laughs> <laughs> that my argument is, is a compliment to your... Not my but, argument, I'm just asking That's right, you, you, that, 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 <laughs> your, your suggestion of whether my argument should that. I, I hope that those two don't conflict, that you have the, the argument of, well, e even if it was there, even if they had had this evidence, the affidavit wouldn't have been sufficient, which is, is certainly a, a viable argument. But it's also, even the, my argument that is what they have it isn't sufficient. Well, it's, it's two steps. Number one, the evidence has to be relevant to the crime. And secondly, there has to be a relevance to, to the, uh, the particular person who's being that, searched. That, that's correct. And yes. you're saying it's so basic it doesn't even fit the crime, so you don't even need to get the probable cause. You didn't say that, but you're now... Uh, yes, I'll, I'll certainly that. say that now. And, then I, and I don't think that conflicts with my other argument that, that if, if, if it was, if they had had some sort of nexus, that, that, that they, they don't have that, they don't have that nexus here. Whether that would have been sufficient had they had it is a, a, a separate argument. Well, no matter what, for the Leon good faith exception, which is Everyone's no one's challenged the fact that the search warrant was found to lack probable cause. So, in order to look at the Leon good faith argument, we have to look at the whole picture. We can't just focus on that little nexus issue. But that's yes, I, I think that's in right. terms of whether the officers had good faith in executing. That's right. The objective, yeah, the, 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 there would have been an objective officer looking at the affidavit. That's correct. I have a fact question. Um, how long was it between the time that um, the the car disappeared? And was or was discovered wrecked, mm. and um, the first or, or the contact with Powell. 
that followed the first anonymous tip? I, I'm not sure. I know that the uh, the anonymous the tip idea. was on, uh, uh, or excuse me, the first contact with him after the first anonymous tip was on September 5th. Right. And I'm not sure. It looks like, uh, I'm not sure, right? That doesn't seem to be in the affidavit. When the this is the reason, I, no, it's not in there. This, this is the reason I'm asking, because there is some information in addition to the uh, three tips in the affidavit about a conversation that was had with Mr. Powell. Um, in which, as soon as he was asked about the incident, he said, I wouldn't have done that because it was my last night on bond supervision and I wouldn't have wanted to get in trouble. And so he didn't need, in other words, the officer reports in the affidavit, he didn't need to be told what the date was. So I'm trying to get a fix on whether it was last week or three months ago or a year ago. Let me see if I can, because I because know they said it was a couple months from the time the uh, affidavit was issued. And so this, the affidavit was signed on September 11th. And I believe they said that the affidavit, the search occurred a couple months after. And the, that's not the date I'm asking about. I'm asking when they, when the actual um, crime occurred. Right, yes. It was but in the, July. But there was a couple of uh, months so, between when the okay. uh, car was taken and when the affidavit. And so in other words, this officer is saying, I found it suspicious that when I brought up this incident, he immediately knew exactly the date that it occurred. Right, yes, yes. And so uh, that's one little tiny piece I, besides I, the tips. I would still say that that would, that may point to his general involvement of the crime. It doesn't point to the probable cause that we're talking about here is probable cause to believe that evidence would be uh, that evidence oh, get here. Uh, that evidence of a particular crime would be found in a particular place. And so the fact that, again, generally that he's involved in the crime doesn't support a search warrant for his blood without there being some connection. Even if, he's, even if they believe he's involved, there's not the, in the affidavit, there's nothing to establish that they would find that, that the blood would, would turn up any, any reasonable evidence. And, and as to that particular point, uh, the prosecutor at the uh, motion to suppress hearing noted that this was pretty big news uh, around Greenwood County. Uh, pretty much everybody knew that a police car had been stolen, and you know, in a, if it's a big event, and, and it was tied to a big event in his life, <laughs> it, 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 yeah. it's, it's not that, I, I'm not sure that that uh, is a, a reasonable conclusion, that it's suspicious that he would recognize that when it was a big event, and it was tied to a specific event in his life. Would you, would you talk about your second issue? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. The second issue is that 2502 uh, does not authorize the issuance of a search warrant for blood. And in 2502, they list out four different categories uh, of, of what a magistrate may issue a search warrant for. And the, uh, the last three, uh, no one argues, uh, applies. But interesting, the last three all deal with the human body. So you have a uh, corpse or a fetus, you have uh, the a felony warrant, and I'm drawing a blank on the third Kidnapping. One. I'm sorry? The person who's been kidnapped. Kidnapped, right, yes, the person who's been kidnapped. And so those seem to be what the legislature, when the legislature was dealing with the human body and when parts of the human body, when the human body can be searched, that seems to be their intent. The, the first one deals with property, uh, items, let's see, uh, anything used in a commission of a crime, any property which constitutes or may constitute a part of the evidence, fruits or instrumentalities of a crime. And there's also contraband. That's and contraband, right? Yes. Uh, which um, uh, I don't think anybody's arguing that his that his blood would be contraband at that point. Uh, the um, so really we're dealing with with property or something used in the crime. Well, why isn't blood like any other tangible property that's subject to scientific tests? Well, I, I think mean that's, that's, it, that's, it. that's what search warrants are for. To to find tangible pieces of property that are subject to te potentially subject to tests, um, firearms, a bottle of vodka, whatever. And why doesn't blood fit in that category? Well, I, I don't because I think it has to fit in, 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 in something in here. So I think it would have to, in Nevada, it would have to be property. 
And uh, I cited the, I got to cite the Dred Scott decision, which you know you do every day, uh, that, that people, are, uh, people are not property. And that the, there's a difference well, between... Well, then subject to constitutional safeguards, uh, uh, why isn't blood, uh, I mean, like other tangible property that's investigated in a crime? Uh, I would... Uh, I, I, it, maybe it's where I'm, I'm running in circles, just to to, uh, to say that. Uh, I mean, I think once it once it gets removed from the body, then uh, like at a blood bank, um, or I think of there was a Seinfeld episode where Kramer was driving his his blood around because the blood bank goes something like that. Once it's outside the body, it's different. But we have a, a special constitutional protections for the body and the the, the parts of the body. Uh, while a person is walking around and using them is fundamentally different property than uh, their possession of a gun or uh, whiskey in the sense that it's it's part of who you are. There's a different constitutional protection. It just doesn't seem like it's property as a definition. And additionally, I think we're dealing with the statutory definition. And as I stated before, if if we're looking at the statute and what did the, leg did the legislature intend human blood to be property in the statute, you can look and you can see the other three sections dealt with the human body. And they didn't include either this, and a lot of other states specifically have statutes saying that you're allowed to search for blood, hair, uh, all of that. And so, so it's the invasive means of gathering this particular type of property that's the problem? I, I think it's the, it's the fundamental nature the of the property which is evidenced by the invasive means. Um, but, but yeah, I think that, that gets to it. Any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> May I please occur, counsel? My name is Joe Lee. I'm the Greenwood County attorney, um, and I was the attorney on this case uh, for the state. I came into it after the crime had occurred. Uh, my predecessor had, had resigned and I took over the case after it had already been filed. Uh, if I may try to answer some of the factual questions that they have. As I understand the facts, the car was stolen off of the lot, the county lot, uh, on July the 22nd. It was found within a day. Okay. Um, right. Then it was a couple months before the first contact with Mr. Powell. Correct. Okay. There, Thank you. There was, well, before Mr. Powell was developed as a, as a suspect. Uh, so we were past the point in time where probably we were going to see cuts and bruises on somebody right. uh, once, he, once his name came up. Right. Okay. Uh, Can we start at the end of your opponent's argument and have you address the, um, the search warrant issue? On, on whether this is property or if you're alleging it's either contraband or something used in the crime? Why well, does the statute cover uh, hair, blood, saliva? Well, I, I think we, it is covered because, uh, and I think the Court of Appeals explained it very well in, in their finding. They, they indicated that it would be uh, blood and tissue here would qualify as property, but also as things which have been used in the commission of a crime. How so? Well, if, if I am committing a, a, a crime against a person, uh, I'm assaulting somebody, and in the course of that, I am uh, using my body, which has blood and tissue, uh, and, and you can leave it there. When Mr. Powell got behind the wheel of that new patrol vehicle and drove it the way he did, he ended up crashing it. Uh, actually crashed at two different locations, but when the officers found what you typically find in, in a car accident, you find uh, the windshield that's broken on the inside, um, and blood and, and various things but to that But that's an argument that it, it was something used in the crime, because well, it, you happen to carry your body around with you when you commit crimes. Is well, that it? you carry it with you and you use it. He used his person, his body, to do these things. Same as if if you have somebody who commits an, a, a rape, he, uh, would he didn't not use be these using parts, did he? He didn't really use his blood. Or, for example, we have a crime um, basically having to do with intentional transmission of a sexually transmiss transmissible disease. I mean, that, there's no question then that you might be using bodily fluids in order to accomplish the criminal act. Um, but here, he wasn't using spit or hair or blood to steal a car, was he? Well, I think overall, but it's what he's leaving 
as the course of the commission of the crime. Well, that, uh, there's no there's no argument about that. He left some of those things behind, right. or the perpetrator did. But how was he, how did the perpetrator use those parts of his or her body to accomplish this? Well, we can't. I would submit we can't separate ourselves from our body. No matter what I I go out and to, to do, if I'm physically taking something, I'm going to have to physically use my person. That's why criminals often uh, use extreme means to uh, wearing gloves so that they don't leave fingerprints, uh, covering up their face uh, with, with uh, you know, so that they commit an armed robbery so that they can be. There's distinguishing factors, and it's very, you, you, now especially in, in, with the scientific age that we're in, detecting the, the, what, what remains of that, of that is available. Now, when council talks about what the legislative and what the legislative intent is, I, I think we need to look back. We've been using biological materials in one form or another for decades now. Uh, That's you your know, practical argument that this will be a mess if we say something. Well, it, it, and not just, but but if you're saying the legislature never intended to do this, the legislature has known the courts have been interpreting uh, search warrants for blood and persons for decades. It's legislative inaction. You're making a legislative inaction argument. Well, the legislature knew what the how the courts were interpreting it, and so they didn't and, make, and did not act. So you and they did not make energy. a mess of what it was because, and certainly if they just said, "Oh, we we don't want that to go on," well, that's not at all though what. The courts have never interpreted this issue. We've never interpreted this issue. There's nothing that would have clued the legislature in that, other than references to biological material being requested in a search warrant. No one that I know of challenged this. Why would the legislature have thought it was a problem? Well, that's, that's true. It wasn't seen as a problem because there were many cases where everybody talks around uh, that there's several Supreme Court cases where they talk about the the DNA if it's obtained legally it can be used right. uh, <coughs> to testing against something else. Yeah, and in all the cases you cite, they use the phrase if it's lawfully obtained, and no one's ever addressed this issue of whether it was lawfully obtained. I'm, I'm not aware this of this statute this, of yeah. this, you know, but uh, this being raised in this in Kansas. Uh, there's cases as cited in the, uh, the Court of Appeals of other jurisdictions finding that it is uh, property or uh, is appropriate uh, for for search warrants. Um, the, the problem with finding its property is I, maybe you could tell from my question of defense counsel, I'm sensitive to your position here, but the other extreme is if it's property and I hit you and you bleed, uh, can that be considered criminal damage to property? That's no, uh, I would not. Why not? I would. I would not consider. Well, or, or, or theft of property. I suppose uh, what you could have. I mean, if you go to the, if I go to the blood bank and instead steal, of kidnapping. Kidnapping. Yeah. Kidnapping. <laughs> instead of kidnapping, instead right. of kidnapping, you call right. it. Uh, you you you. There's a more specific crime that deals directly with what the, a battery would be or kidnapping that sort of thing. Uh, so I, I do see a distinction there. You would prosecute whichever gave you the highest severity level, right? To be honest, it would never even occur to me to, to charge a criminal damage to property when somebody's been punched. So why, uh, is, why is it property here? That's the question. I would, I would well, in the, in the interpretation of what we're looking for, when they, they gave a broad interpretation of what things are, we're not talking about the actual person we're talking about parts of a person um, if that makes any sense and I may not be so but your two arguments for why this fits under the statute are inconsistent with each other right because your first one depends upon it being intrinsic to the body not being separable right well, it's used I, in the crime because it's intrinsic it's it's inherent in the body itself and your property argument says if you don't if you don't buy that here's option two it doesn't have anything to do with body or it can be separated from the body and therefore it's property but this but the statute itself gives different options for how I understand that but um, isn't it true that those two would be they'd be different right the basis of your argument is completely different well I, I'm, I don't see it that way but uh, I, you know, 
part of, part of what the statute does call for or, or, or any property which constitutes or may be considered a part of the evidence. And I think those words are important because when you start talking about property which constitutes or may be consider a part of the evidence, then the material that's located at a crime scene is is going to be crucial. But that's, that's not what you're trying to recover from him. You have that. The law enforcement has that. They got that when they recovered the car. Right. And without it, anything... It still has to be property before it can be evidence that's recoverable via a search warrant under the statute. That's what we're, that's what we're focused on. I agree with you. Those, those words are very important. But it still has to be property in the first instance, and that's what we're struggling with. And don't we have to look to the criminal code definition of property, which is anything of value, tangible or intangible, real or personal? And how is saliva something of value? Well, it has value as evidentiary value in this case, and, and hundreds of thousands of others. You know, if, if we start going and... and Looking at you can't issue a subpoena for for biological material. We're not going to be able to investigate law enforcement. It's not going to be able to investigate and develop a suspect on homicides, rapes. Uh, you know, a lot of burglaries where there's blood or, or things left. It was just I, I I think part of when it was not raised as an issue for these decades. Uh, it was being interpreted that you could do a search warrant for a person to to obtain these things, uh, blood, hair, for comparison purposes. And I I, I think that we would really be putting our, ourselves in the situation of society, in a situation where we're not, uh, we have now things that can identify an individual if they don't have a twin to the one in, Six six trillion, I think, was what the, the the odds were in regards to Mr. Powell being the the, the contributor of the, of the materials here. Mr. Lee, I think we all understand the uh, practical importance of being able to do that. But I guess what I need to know is, given the noise about separation of powers that we hear quite a bit uh, in this region of the city, uh, why is it? that the judicial branch should redo the legislative branch's uh, statute to benefit the executive branch's ability to enforce the laws. In other words, why is it our job to clean up this legislation to benefit you and the executive branch when that's really not our job. I, I would disagree that it needs to be cleaned up because I don't think it's broken. I, uh, I, I think that this is a, a logical interpretation of the statute as other jurisdictions have, have found it to be, uh, as, as the Court of Appeals have indicated in their opinion. So if, if this court were to decide differently, then I would think that the legislature would be, there would be a flurry of activity, I would hope so, in regards to saying, okay, now we're going to to, to say bloods and persons and so forth, uh, but which happens all the time. That's a perfectly acceptable conversation between the branches of government. If the legislature's failed to accomplish something under a court ruling, then the legislature is always free to go back and fix it. Isn't that what we just witnessed with the special session a few weeks ago? When the U.S. Supreme Court's case was um, responded that, to, that's true. That's true. But when we get, when I, I come back to, if it's not broke, it, you know, why fix it? I don't. And I'm see still it looking for your broken. argument on why it's not broken because I'm not understanding your property argument. It's it's evidence certainly once it's in your hands, but when it's still when it hasn't been severed from someone's body, it's pro it's still property. Well. I think it also comes back to the other other portion of that, where it uh, something that's used in the course of a of of the crime. But that's modifying the word property. If you look at the statute, that phrase that you keep pointing to is modifying the word property. So it still must be property. Uh, 
That's true. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. I, 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 I really don't. I, I see it in, in a way, maybe I'm just not free enough to think or the, to, to, to go in that way, but it, I, to me, it, it's something that uh, when you, whether you're looking at a person's image uh, for identification or uh, fingerprints, what we're doing, I mean, are we talking about property in the sense of a car? No. But is it something that is can be used uh, to, to move something, something the other traditional uh, uh, interpretations of property? Uh, I, I think it has to have a broad uh, interpretation. Is there any other? Could you briefly address the the uh, affidavit and assuming that we don't fight off on this suggestion that somehow there is a inferred link or that even if there is an inferred link uh, well, we, could, we, we would you know it would actually be sufficient what about the remainder of it if all that's left is the anonymous tips and the and the discussion of him denying that he committed this act in the interview what about that would possibly establish even sufficient okay. cause to cause a you know so a reasonable officer could rely on that in good faith. I think all officers know that three anonymous tips aren't sufficient. Well, the longer I do this, the less I I, I count on what officers know and don't. Well, we've know. certainly said several yeah. times that anonymous tips aren't sufficient. You know, if, if they don't have, if there's no indication of the basis of the knowledge, the veracity of the witness. Um, there's no corroboration. Well, there was. We've made that very clear, and there's there's none of that here. These were anonymous callers. They they didn't. There's nothing. There's just nothing other than I guess one of them apparently said something about she was she or he was a hundred percent certain that this was, but didn't demonstrate what the what what that certainty. Was but, about, but the officer didn't just stop with the with the. He went and contacted Ryan Powell, right. and he he denied he, it. He de, he denied it. He asked him to if he would take blood uh, or give a sample. At, at some point, he said he would, and then he, he did not come right. in there. That doesn't give any cause to believe it's it's him. Well, but it also was not an issue that was raised at the trial level. It was not raised on appeal. No, but it's it's in front of us because we have to talk about good faith. And we have to talk about why the officers could have relied on this affidavit in total. Well, when the officers, you talk about what the officers were relying upon in good faith. And in this situation, the officer had taken the, the affidavit to a judge in the middle of the day. It was a chief district court judge. We're not talking about somebody that's not trained in the law. Uh, there was no indication that there was anything that, reason why the judge couldn't give it his full attention he hadn't that, that, that's when you're doing a lean on good faith analysis you assume that you know that there's been a finding that there wasn't probable cause despite the judge's signature on the affidavit so but, we're not talking about that anymore we're talking about what on the face of the affidavit would lead a reasonable officer to conclude that there was probable cause well i i think the officer believed that's what he had at the point because he did have these other factors in here. He did. What he, other factors? Well, the other factors that, that you mentioned in regards to the, the anonymous tips, which, but also the, the defendant's behavior in and of itself. And what was that behavior? <coughs> he, that he it's, denied it? And he said, I'll give you a sample, and he changed his mind. About well, he we also gave information. Well, I know it was this particular night because that's when my bond supervision ran out. Right. Um, what, what about that would, would provide probable cause to believe he he committed this crime? Probable cause. Well, I, I'm not really prepared in regards to that uh, argument because that wasn't raised at the lower levels. I'm, I, I apologize to that. But I think there, when, when you put it in there with genetic material as to, as to why to, we're, we're, we're sam sampling for this individual, I think... Uh, you know, it, it's it's not the strongest one, I'll grant you, but I think there was enough, uh, as apparently did the defense counsel when they made the argument, and as the appellate defense counsel did when they raised it on appeal, or, or didn't raise well, it Well, I mean, the appeal. very issue at trial was the good faith exception, so I'm not sure I understand why you wouldn't be prepared to talk about the affidavit 
and how it establishes probable cause or how these officers could have reasonably relied on it despite the finding that there was no probable cause. Well, I, That's I guess, the issue. I guess what I'm saying is the the judge didn't see it as an issue, so the officer could, you know, says, if the judge is saying, hey, look, detective, you don't have enough here. You, you need to have somebody. Uh, we already know that wasn't, the judge didn't, there right. wasn't enough. But, 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 but then, the, then the officer would, would, would certainly be put on notice that he's not getting it signed. So is but there, why would the officer now believe, uh, oh yes, the officer should have believed back in September 11th of, of 2007 when the uh, trial attorney didn't raise it. It wasn't preserved for appeal, in my opinion, in that respect. Uh, appellate uh, counsel did and it was brought up here today in that regard. So there's there's been the, the initial judge, another level of, of, of judges, and now it's being raised. How is that detective back in 07 supposed to have known? I think the officers have to believe, and this is not a case where you know, he says, well, let's, let's try to get one passed. It's not one of these situations where it's a, a nine-page affidavit over four different defendants that they're making a, a, an application for to search their homes, where things can get confusing and so forth. What it was here was the elephant in the room. The, the officer knew they had genetic material, and he just but simply didn't, didn't make a statement. But they didn't have enough to get there. Well. That's the problem. Just having genetic material doesn't get you to him. But we had, I'd say, coupled with the other factors, there was sufficient. Okay. And certainly the officer, you know, would would believe that he did because he has a district court judge approving it. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, well, I take full responsibility for not uh, raising the, the issue of the the overall probable cause in the warrant as it relates to the crime. Uh, Jay Witt, who I want to give credit for the novel 22-2502 argument, Jay Witt was a counsel for that, and he did argue that the affidavit was, was insufficient, N not arguing the nexus, but arguing the affidavit itself on uh, the, the hearing is volume three at page 57. Uh, he says, uh, certainly the court can go back to the affidavit and consider again, but if we were to take the bare bones here, but the basis in the affidavit is that there were three anonymous tips by one or more anonymous tipster without having any indicia of reliability. We have no indicia. Plus the defendant was being, plus the defendant being nervous when being questioned, that is just not probable cause here. And then he goes on to, to debate it. But that seems to me that he addressed the fact that the individual components of the affidavit were insufficient. So it was raised at the trial court. I didn't raise it, and I understand I'm, I'm uh, court that, but I want to make sure that Mr. Witt was uh, covered his bases. And this all gets a little, little intertwined, but we're really looking at was the officer justified in relying on the judge's assessment of that affidavit, aren't we, when we're talking about good faith? Because the officer does have... <laughs> A judicial officer that said this is okay. Sure, but we, uh, the officer, uh, we going in and we look at, well, first an objective officer, so we don't look at this individual officer, and he, according to Leon, he has to look at that affidavit, the affidavit looks at it to see whether there is an indicia, he can't just take the judge's word for it. Is there, is there some indicia of probable cause there? And so, yeah, is there anything to override the judge's decision? Uh, is there something that, is there not enough there to override the judge's decision? So yeah, I, I think that's it. But in here, there's, there, there's nothing uh, to point on the nexus, and there's very little uh, on the, uh, the affidavit as a whole. On the, on the good faith exception <coughs> issue, as I'm looking back over your brief, I don't see any argument about that the, that the purposes of the exclusionary rule would be served. Uh, by it, the deterrent value. I mean, I don't see you arguing that the conduct of the officers was deliberate or reckless or grossly negligent. I mean, they presented this information to the judge. The judge signed off on the warrant, good, good, bad, or ugly. And so excluding this evidence provides what deterrent value well, to the I, officers? I, I think um, that the deterrent value is that officers need to 
review the warrant and basically not just sort of take a flyer with the judge. There's something there. Let's go see see if the judge will, will sign it. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think inherent in the I guess it, it, under the Leon test, it's whether an objectively reasonable officer would think there was an issue of probable cause. And it's it's difficult in that to see, to layer in some sort of ill will or some sort of um, malfeasance by the officer I, I, into that because you're assu assuming an objectively reasonable officer in that case would look at it. And so I, I assume from, so that, wait, from wait, the wait, wait. An objectively reasonable officer is going to review the affidavit after the court or after a neutral detached magistrate has found probable cause to question the the warrant? As, as I understand it, that's what the Leon test says, is that would an objectively reasonable officer review, uh, find, looking at the affidavit, find that it was so lacking in probable cause to uh, find that the affidavit was, was unreasonable? My question, though, was, uh, you know, you look at the Davis versus U.S. case, which from a couple of years ago, that talks about in order to invoke the exclusionary rule, you have to look to the deterrent value. And I don't see that you've argued the deterrent value in your brief. Am uh, I correct in you that? You are correct in that, yes. Okay. I, I do think that the the deterrent value is in, in its, that if that the Leon court considered the deterrent value in each of its exceptions, in creating those exceptions. That was the purpose of Leon. And so when it created those exceptions, it was in order to deter the police officers. That was the purpose of Leon. And I, so I think by, if I meet those exceptions, I have the imprint of the U.S. Supreme Court saying that this will the, deter officers in the future. Well, I, I, I disagree with you. I think Davis is trying to tell us that the invocation of the exclusionary rule has got to have this element of deterrent value other than just a gotcha. That, that okay, we found a violation of the Fourth Amendment, so the evidence, so we will not invoke it. I mean, I think they're saying we've got to look at the police conduct and find some value in excluding this otherwise legitimate evidence sure. uh, from being used. And so that's why I think deter showing that there's a recklessness or a deliberateness by the police, you know, that slaps their hand when you do that. And I just don't, I didn't see that argument. You've said it's not there. That's, that's fine. right. That's yeah. fine. Factually, these, uh, the officer that took, made the affidavit and took it to the uh, uh, judicial officer, did they have anything going for them on probable cause other than anonymous tips? You mean what was included in the affidavit? Right. They, I, mean, uh, I mean, basically, they wouldn't be there if they hadn't relied on these anonymous tips. I, I, I think that that's it, yes. And there is some deterrence uh, effect there when we were telling officers you got to do more than just answer the phone you, you're going to have to investigate those tips and and get some indicia of reliability you're going to have to ascertain how and why they may have known what they know and right that kind of thing and, and I think that was what I was trying to get at you before that you can't just write something down and take it to a judge and, and, and hope that they sign it so even though you didn't argue it what's your argument here that should have happened but, uh, what should the deterrent effect here? That that after the warrant is signed by the, the judge, they should have reviewed the affidavit and realized, oh, this is just anonymous tips. I should have done more, and I shouldn't execute the warrant? Well, I think from the deterrent value, we can go before they take it to the judge. I think that the deterrent value would be that you don't take it to a, a flimsy warrant uh, to a judge, or one that's, that's, one that's not, even, not even close here. Um, that you have to have, to give a judge that you, that a reasonable officer is going to fill out a, a reasonable affidavit. And I, and I think the test does say that they look at it afterwards, that a reasonable officer is, when they get the affidavit, they're going to look at the affidavit and see, does it support some indicia of probable cause? That's how I read Leon. We have any further questions of counsel? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.